12.15. I'm going to go ahead and get started. We only have 45 minutes this, uh, this afternoon, I guess. Um, I have the uh, privilege of competing with Lunch and E.L. James. So um, that's, that's what I get to do. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for uh, wanting to learn a little bit more about printing. Um, I did a little informal poll earlier. Uh, first time authors, first book is coming out. Okay, so half, it, half maybe half the room already have a book out. All right, so there's a little bit more than that. Um, so the beginning of this presentation, um, as I go through it, is gonna be, uh, is gonna be 101 printing stuff. So for those of you who have been around, who understand printing, it's gonna really be a little bit of a review, but I find it really important to start there because um, as, we, as I mentioned earlier too, Amazon kind of has changed the way and, and, and Spark have changed the way that authors view printing these days. It's like, well, I just upload my file and everything's good, right? I mean, there's, I, I don't have to understand any of this other stuff. And that's true if you're using those printing options, but if you wor start working with a real printer, there's a, there's a vernacular that's involved with that. There's a terminology. And so understanding some of that terminology is really important. All right, so um, this is what we're going to uh, talk about a little bit today. Sorry about that, it's a little bit dark on the screen. Printing 101, talk about the terminology, publishing and print strategies. Uh, this is an important part of the industry. If you're in the content industry, if you're talking about books, uh, printing is, is an important part of that. Print options uh, for authors today and then opportunities for authors. So those are the four things we're gonna try to go over. So some of the most common terms uh, that you're gonna see in the industry here, who knows what the head of a book is? Anybody? Wow, okay, great. So when you have a book like this, and this is terminology that your printer's gonna use, and they're gonna ask you, you know, a question about the head of your book, and you don't, you're like, I, I don't know. This is the head of your book. So what do you think the foot of the book is? Wow. Foot of the book is down here. What's the face of the book? No, it is not the front cover. cover. The face of your book is this edge. This is the cover of your book. This is the face of your book, okay? So uh, spine, most people know what that is. This is that's this edge right here. And then uh, a signature. Who knows what a signature of a book is? It's not what you write. Yes, sir. Comedy. Yeah, depending on the press, if you're running books that ha are, are, if you're running a, uh, on a digital press, they're printing a two-page signature, which is front and back, okay? If you're running on a, an offset press, a lot of times that's an eight-page signature or a 16-page signature or even more than that. And that, so that's the grouping of pages and the pagination that the printer lays out so that it prints all of the pages and goes into bindery in signatures. So they have pockets in the bindery that then take the book and produce it, bind it, and so forth, and then trim it at the end. So it's really, it, one of the things that's important to understand about signatures is you may be starting digitally uh, with your design, your planning, so forth, you're printing 10 copies, 15 copies, completely okay. Uh, someday you hope you get to the point where you're printing hundreds or thousands of units at a time. And then, you, so you want to have your book laid out in a way that it's compatible with signatures. Because if you don't, for example, if I'm working with a press that has a 16 page signature and my signature or my page count break goes to I'll use a, a number here, 129 pages versus 128. Now guess what's gonna happen? You're gonna end up with 15 blank pages at the end of your book. And that's why you start to see that. You start to go, gosh, how, how, why do I have all these blank pages? Well, that's because this, that's the signature break. So you wanna be thinking about these things early on in the process, okay? Let's talk about uh, a, a few more terminology things that are important to understand. Everybody know what DPI is? Dots per inch, it's a resolution thing for images. Okay, so you're gonna hear people say, it's gotta be 300 DPI. That means that any image that you're producing, whether it's on the cover or on the interior of the book, really has to be a minimum of 300 DPI resolution in order to print properly, otherwise it, appears muddy or it may appear uh, you know, um, out of focus or any of those types of things. Anybody know what embossing is? Yes, sir, or yes, ma'am. Is, 
it has a texture to it? Yeah, so an emboss is actually where that um, image is raised off the paper, okay? So a lot of times you'll see embossing being on a, uh, a, a slip, or a, on a, uh, a jacket, dust jacket, for example. So it's, it's lifted off. So what would a deboss be? It's actually imprinted into it. So you'll see that a lot of times on, on a hardcover of a book where they'll press into it for a deboss. All of those things are typically available in what we call long run printing. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, foil, or foil stamping. Does any, everybody know what that is typically? So you can foil stamp a, a hard cover. You, know, you can foil stamp a soft cover. You can foil stamp a dust jacket. All of those things can be foil stamped. The challenge with that and the reason why it's hard to do that in a short run digital environment is that you have to create a die in order to do that. This die is created to press that gold leaf or silver leaf or whatever it is onto your product. And that's a fixed cost. So if you're only printing 50, you're spreading that die over 50 units. If you're printing 500, you're spreading it over 500 units. That's why there's a big cost difference there. Any questions about, uh, about foil? Okay. Spot color, spot varnish. Anybody know what that is? Yes. That's right. So it's it, it it creates a shine on a particular part of your cover. So the spot varnish does that. So a lot of times you'll print a book in a soft cover or in a mat, and then you have an overlay of a gloss that highlights specific areas of your cover. Again, typically that's not available in a short run, but it is available in what we call long run printing. Um, and then the, uh, the last thing that I always like to talk about, because this is something that our printer will talk to you about too, is the make ready cost. So in digital printing, or let me explain what make ready, that's the cost of setting up your job. So it's the cost if you're doing long run printing of making plates, of taking your files through pre-press, of proofing those files, of setting up the press, getting paper out, that's all make ready cost, make, re make ready. And, and typically that's a fixed cost that's involved with setting up your job. Again, that's the reason why you, if you have a, uh, a, a shorter number of units and versus a longer number of units, more units, it's less cost to produce that up here because you're spreading out that make ready cost over a larger number of units. Digital printing has a much, much lower make ready cost because you're putting the files in electronically and it's typically being delivered electronically to a press and printing those things out. Questions about that? any of those types of terminology? Again, these are, these are the terms that your printers are gonna use if you start to work with printers outside of Amazon and, yes, question. Digital printing, well, I'll get, I'll get to that in just a second here. We'll talk about digital printing versus POD versus offset, all of that. Great question. Anybody know what PPI is? It can be, it can be pixels per inch, yes, or it, it's also pages per inch. So in the printing terminology, and in, in, for printers, they're gonna talk about PPI as being the pages per inch. So that's the thickness, the caliper of your paper. In most cases, digital printing, short run printing, POD, which is all the same, we'll get to that, is, um, is, is around between 400 and 450 PPI. That's the type of paper. And, and the reason why it stays within that range is because all of the equipment is very similar and you can only get certain papers to roll through that pro the, the, those presses. Yes, paper by weight though is something that you're gonna you're gonna say. Well, I'm looking for a, a 50 pound white. Yeah. Well, guess what? A 50 pound white will vary on the paper. It'll a 50 pound white I've seen as low as like 380 PPI, or a 50 pound white as high as 450. And if you've got a thicker book, you can't go by the weight of the paper. You have to understand what the PPI is of that paper. Otherwise, your spine is gonna be off. Does that make sense? So that's why it's important. And it, it, you, it's like I, we had the setup here with that question. 
you know, the question is, do, do, you know, the paper weight, is that important? Yes, it's, it's important when you're talking about trying to f figure out kind of where you want to be with paper, but the most important measurement is that PPI measurement. So make sure that you understand what that, what that is, because it's going to vary by printer by printer. Not all paper is created equal. So everybody should know what bleed is in here. Is there anybody that doesn't know what bleed is? So bleed is, is that image that comes to the edge, comes to the edge and past the edge of a trim, okay? So bleed is really, really important to understand that when you submit a file to a printer, if you don't have enough bleed, printing has a tolerance, so this book can move on press. And printing tolerances typically are a 32nd to an eighth of an inch. That's allowable, okay? So as that pr book moves, if you only have your image right to the edge of your trim line and it moves, you're gonna end up with a white line on, on one of your or all of your edges. So you want to have a bleed. What a bleed means is you're taking that image past the trim line, typically a minimum of an eighth of an inch. Uh, a lot of printers prefer a quarter of an inch just to be safe. Super important to understand as you're working with your designer and then working with your printer, making sure that you have enough bleed. Um, ISBNs and barcodes, I put this on here because uh, I've worked with a lot of um, authors. I, I print for hundreds and hundreds of indie authors. I broker print. So uh, a lot of times I will actually get a file from a new author um, and it doesn't have a barcode on it. And I'm like, well, that's okay, I'll print it that way, but do you understand that you can't sell it to a, at retail without a barcode? And a lot of times they're like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that. And so make sure that when you produce your files the first time, produce them with a barcode. There are actually places online you can do barcodes for free, okay? You don't have to buy your barcode for Bowker. Um, you can do it for free, just search for free barcodes online. You can, you can manufacture that and put, make sure that that's on your cover. But it's very important to do. Um, and I think my image, I lost my image. Um, it's, a, it's a personal preference, price on barcode. I'm not sure who was asking that question. Oh, back there. Um, I, I've worked with, I, I probably have been in 600, to, between 600 and 700 retailers around the country over my career. Um, and uh, most of the retailers I talk to would prefer not to have price, prices on the back because then it allows them flexibility to do whatever they want to with that book. So if you put a price on it, you force that retailer to utilize that price point. Um, so when we work with our clients, we don't put prices on the back just for that reason. Yes? What, I'm sorry, what was the question? So the barcode is just simply uh, utilizing the ISBN number. So the, there's, when you put the ISBN in a, into a barcode generator, it's gonna generate essentially lines that mean the same thing as what that number is. So there's really nothing else that has to be there um, uh, in, in terms of the barcode. Now, I, I, I had an image, and I'm not sure exactly what happened to it, but um, the, there's, there's the, the information that you'll see above a, a lot of books in terms of um, the categories, that's called BISAC information, B-I-S-A-C, BISAC information. That doesn't have any do, anything to do with the barcode or the ISBN. That's a categoriz categorization tool that you're gonna want to use to help your retailer place that book in, in the right place in the store. Okay, yes? Great question. Great question. ISBN numbers in the U.S., the clearinghouse for that, for ISBN numbers is called Bowker.com or MyIdentifiers.com. Bowker is B-O-W-K-E-R.com. That's where the clearinghouse is. Uh, do not buy barcode or, or, or ISBNs on the secondary market from somebody else because that barcode has already been registered to that other person or that other company. Um, that's my recommendation. You're free to do whatever you want, but uh, I know that when we're setting up and helping uh, authors be set up as independent publishers, they want to be registered as the owner of that number. Yes? 
it, yeah, it takes you to the same place, myidentifiers.com. It's, it's just this, like the sub page or whatever. Yeah, for Bowker. Yes? No, it's just the, the barcode itself only reads that number. But above it, you're going you're gonna to typically see it on most books, and you should be on all books, but on most books, you're going to see uh, the categorization for that book. And it generally goes down three different levels. Okay, so yeah, it's typically right above it. Yeah, just so that w a store buyer, a clerk, whoever it is, knows where to look to see where they're supposed to stick that book. Question. Perfect. Yeah, for the online listeners, that was a, a suggestion. Only put the pricing on the barcode or with it embedded in the barcode if you're giving a full retail discount. Great. Yes. Again, the, the, for the online folks, that was, you know, Ingram Sparks is going to charge you to make those changes if you change your price down the road um, and have to change your barcode and so forth. So, good. All right. So, this is really interesting because as I work with in, independent authors, a lot of times they're like, well, okay, I, I, I want to see a proof. And I'm like, well, okay, is that a hard proof or a soft proof? And they're like, well, I don't know what the difference is. So, here's the difference. A hard proof is actually one copy of your book, Okay. And, and, and we can do that. The challenge with that is you can't use a hard proof to uh, proof for color. Uh, it's for what we call four position only. And that means you're looking at all the elements of that book, the, the content, the images, all those things, are they in the right place? If you start to look at that book in terms of color, there's no way to color match from one press to another press. Okay, you have to have a color proof that's approved to make that happen, and digitally that it's just it's really non-existent. And the other challenge is is that typically a one-off copy is coming from this press over here, and your press run is coming from this press over here, and so it might be different paper, slightly different paper, it might be different calipers, might be different uh, hue on the paper, all of those types of things. So about 98% of my proofing now with my clients comes with what's called a soft proof. And that is a ripped PDF file going through the print system that, that you approve that shows, again, for position only, what's in the book. Is everything there? Are all the elements embedded? And it's much faster, too, because typically that comes in just a couple of days. If you, want, if you need to have a hard proof, you're looking at weeks typically to get one copy in and then if you have to make a change and then do another one it's another few weeks and so it's a long process whereas that soft proof can just take a couple of days yes Right. So the question is, you know, how do you deal with a printer where you, you do a proof and it's just it's 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 off the printing the color is off and you need to make some changes. Uh, typically, a printer is printing what you send them. And they're, so they're not going to make any changes to that. Certainly not at the digital level. There are a, a lot of options open up when you get to an offset level. And we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like. Uh, because that's where the, 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 the pressman is actually dialing in those numbers for each color to make sure that it's appearing exactly the way you want it to. Digital presses are preset and they don't change them. Um, and so it, it, at that point in time, it comes back to you and your designer to either um, slightly change the coloring, boost the saturation of the color um, so that it's not dark and muddy, maybe lighten it up within the image so it looks a little bit lighter on screen than you may like it, but it's actually gonna print better. So those are all things you'd have to do. Okay. 
Yeah, if you have a green cast, or I think you said there was some that had a blue cast as well, um, that's, those are, that's, dirty, that's, that's a dirty printer. I mean, the, the, the print units themselves are dirty and they're doing that. And so the printer should be taking care of you and going, okay, I need to clean that up and give you something that looks like your proof. Yes. Yes. We didn't talk about the color on online or on, on the monitor versus in print, um, but I, I can. I mean, uh, typically a, a, a printer, uh, an, a, a screen is reading color in what's called RGB, okay? And then printing, typically a printer is gonna ask for a CMYK file. Some printers can convert and they will convert. Um, Amazon, I think, does and, and some others do. They just convert within the electronic process. But that doesn't mean that what you're seeing on screen is what you're going to get. They're different. And so, you know, if, 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 you're, if you're super color critical in your product, that's when you're going to want to go to actual color proofing. And that's when you sign off on color proofs and they're really expensive and you have to send them back to your press. And then they literally put those pages that you've signed off on on the counter right in front of the press and as they dial things in they're matching it to exactly that color. So you recommend people uh, that you do not let the printer know that they're putting it back and that is totally optical or that's not recognized or what do you kind of recommend? So pan coloring is the question and whether or not to use that. Uh, if you're doing a um, if you're doing like a two color project and it's black and a Pantone, yeah, absolutely. But most color covers, for example, are being produced with four color, Im you know, everything's four color. And so that's why you want to output that file as a CMY CMYK file. Yeah. Good, good questions. All right, so we're in the content business. All of my pictures seem to have disappeared, so I don't, I'm not exactly sure why, but. Um, you know, three early questions you want to ask. You guys are all authors. You're, you're really good about asking, should be really good about asking who your audience is. But one of the questions that doesn't always come up is how do you want that content consumed? Or how do your customers want that content consumed? And so for, with some authors, um, it, it becomes a, well, I'm going to just do eBooks. Um, or I'm going to just do paper. Uh, or I'm going to just do this or that. and the, the, the industry has changed so much in the last 20 years that people want to consume content the way they want to consume it. And so every author needs to consider all the different formats. So ebooks, audiobooks, paper, hardcover, softcover, all, all of those types of things. And so this is just a reminder that that's an important part of where we are in this, in this industry today. So is ebook only the, the uh, strategy the best? It may be for you. Uh, I, I tend to, um, obviously, as a printer, um, say that it's not. And here are some of the reasons why. Give me pe uh, readers what they want. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what happened with all my images. So I had some, you can, you can do this online as well, but search, get online and just search the difference between what's happening with the ebook market and with the paper book market. You know, I, I've been in this industry for 27 years. I've worked, worked when ebooks were first coming out and the, the, the cry was, well, ebooks are gonna take over the world. There isn't gonna be a paper book available, et cetera, et cetera. And you saw the ebook sales go like this, and then you saw it plateau, and then you actually saw it, started to see it come down. There are more books and units uh, of paper books being printed today than ever before. The paper book is not going away. People like paper. Not everybody wants it that way. Some people want paper when they're reading at home, but they might want the ebook when they're reading on the plane. So there's difference in how they consume that. So print books are really important for uh, author, uh, author copies and direct sales. Ben Wolf is standing in the back, did a class on direct sales. He's a direct sales master, and you can't, you know, you have to have print books in order to do that. And, and sometimes as you grow, you have to have a lot of print books in order to do that. And so, you know, using 
uh, KDP uh, or using Amazon print or using Ingram Spark print for five or 10 or 20 copies is great until you outgrow that. And then you need to be looking at ways to print more and, 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 and print cheaper. Um, so how many? This is where we had the discussion we were talking about short versus long. So in the industry, um, short run is typically 500 units or less. So when a, you're talking to a printer and they're like, well, how many you want to print? 500 units or less, less is going to be short run. Um, and we're going to talk about digital POD in a second. Um, long, long run is considered 500 units or more. Okay. And so when we get into those, um, I had some images of actually printers and um, what they look like, but a digital printer is the same thing as a POD printer. It's the exact same thing. In one case, you're printing one book in, if for, for print on demand or what we call print to order. In another case, you're printing 50 copies of one book. You know, so it's the same print engine, it's the same process, and all those types of things. And so the cost per unit typically doesn't change between one and 50. Sometimes there's a little bit of a price rate break if you go to 100 or 250, those types of things. Um, but the cost, uh, the, the cost of that make ready that we talked about is, um, is, is a lot less. So offset printing is where you have a print engine that has multiple heads on it. So there, I had a picture and I can't, it's not popping up. And each of those heads is, is, is an ink color. So CMYK, the four ink colors. And each one of those is dialed in based on the files that we get from you. So those, the, and, and, and then we create um, uh, actual plates. Those plates go on rollers and as the paper is going through the, through the print press, it's actually applying that ink one, one layer at a time to the process. And so the make ready of that is a lot more expensive and so it doesn't pay to do print runs on an offset press for typically less than 500 units. Okay, but when you get to that point, that's when options really start to open up. Actually, I had a picture here uh, beside this uh, importance of micro inventory with Ben's, Ben's books because he is a micro inventory um, uh, expert. He knows what he needs for every show that he goes to. He prints those things. Sometimes he drop ships those to the event. Sometimes he brings them along with him or a combination of both. But having micro inventory is important for you as an author because you're starting to deal with people and you have the opportunity to sell direct to people and you meet people and you wanna be able to, sometimes you wanna give away a copy, sometimes you need to, you're selling them at various events. So having that micro inventory is really, really important. Distribution inventory is where now you're starting to have these relationships with customers that um, are potentially retailers. And you need to have something that's available for that retailer where you can ship that to them very, very quickly. You're competing now against Random House and HarperCollins and other people. And those publishers have inventory sitting on the shelf ready to ship out same day to those retailers. So that's what a retailer is expecting to get. Yes? Yes, the question is, do you have the opportunity to print long run and sell on Amazon? And the, the answer is yes, you can do that. It's called Vendor Central. So it's, it's a different setup. Uh, that's where Amazon is now coming to you and saying, here's my PO for 50 copies or 100 copies. You ship it to Amazon. They put it in their distribution ware warehouses, and then they pay you on con essentially on consignment for that. A lot of my children's books authors they don't like, you know, they want to have something that's really nice to be able to sell and sell through Amazon. And so that's how we set those authors up, for example. So good question. It, it can happen that way. should happen that way. Yes? Yeah. Yes. 
Yeah, I, and I, I'm sorry, Seller Central, Vendor Central, it, I think they've, yeah, it's just, I, that's what I'm talking about. So Seller Central, yes, you can do both. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is where my picture, I'm not sure, I think it happened when I saved my, uh, saved my presentation for the online folks. So they're, so they're probably seeing the picture and you guys can't. Yeah, they're seeing the picture. I, I don't know what happened, that's, it's technology for you. So we've already talked about print-on-demand, print-on-demand print strategy, short-run printing, it's the same equipment, um, offset printing. Gosh, you gotta love technology. So, options. Um, when you're starting out, your options are kind of hardcover, softcover. You're, you're, you're starting off with Amazon Print and their hardcover option is, is okay, it's not great. It looks okay, it doesn't look great. Sometimes you get books in from Amazon and, and uh, they're damaged and sometimes you get them you know, in 29 boxes for 29 books. I've heard that story. It's crazy. Um, so hardcover, softcover, you're aware of that. So a printed case, is what Amazon is doing, um, like that. So this is a printed case. This is a product that we just printed for uh, Wayne Kramer. Uh, the difference is, of course, that we can do dust jackets. So, so this is a printed case is where the image is printed on the outside of case. So printed case, got it? And then, but we can do the wrap. And we can do that in short run which again for me is 50 units or more. Uh, we can do it in long run, uh, but those options are, are, should be available to you. So you have both of those. It is a hardcover. So this is a printed case hardcover. It's got the image on it, okay? This is a hardcover as well with a dust jacket, but it's cloth. It's not cloth, but it's, it, it, people call it a cloth cover, okay? We did this particular print run for a special edition for Kevin, Kevin Anderson. Um, he didn't want any, any foil on it, he just wanted it plain. So the material actually on this product is called a rainbow material, okay? So it's got a, you can hear it, it's got a little bit of a, a pattern to it as well. So this is, a rainbow material custom print run for an author where we do color end sheets, foil, actual four color printing on the, uh, the rainbow material as well. So those are the things that uh, are available to you and should give you some ideas about maybe what you want to do in the future. So the considerations that we need that every printer is gonna need from you if you're talking to us are gonna be the cover, uh, cover design file, the color profile, which is RGB or CMYK. We need to know what the trim size is. We talked about paper a little bit earlier. Short run, you're gonna have limited paper options. Long run, you're gonna have a lot more paper options. Uh, coding styles, weights of paper, all of those types of things. Um, Cover treatments, we talked about this already too in terms of things like foil stamp and emboss or deboss or spot varnish or any of those types of things. If you're looking for those things, we need to know about that right up front. Uh, and then page count, of course, is really important because page count dictates signatures and it also dictates price. Yes? Yeah, uh, so the question is about trim sizes and, and, and preferences and so forth. I, I don't know that stores care whether it's six by nine or five and a half by eight, eight by eight and a half. I mean, you can answer that question, but yeah. So, I mean, a store is gonna want it a, bit, a little bit thicker book because then you can see what the spine looks like. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that's a great question because when we're talking to, I, I, I do projects where we do 20,000 words, well, that's a, for us, that's a five by eight, 112 page book. We bring the trim size down so that we can get a little bit of heft to it because you don't want the thing to be so, so skinny that you know, people pick that up and there's, a, there's not much perceived value there. So you want some, some heft to it, so that's where you play with your trim sizes, okay? 
Uh, we have other projects that we've done where you've got a, 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 you know, 150, 200,000 word project and that thing is a beast and so you're at six by nine but the interior layout really starts to, you need to crowd that thing so that you can get your page count down a, a little bit because some printers, most printers can do about 750, 800 pages for a book. Uh, some printers, I can, I've, got, I've got a couple of options where I can go bigger than that but it's just so expensive. And so you want to keep that price point down as well so that your reader's not paying $45 for a book. I mean, it's, you're competing with books that are 29 or, or 24. So it, yeah, trim size can be very important and should be very important and thought of right at the beginning of the project. So did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, good, yes. What, what edge are you to the edge? Yeah, rough edge is, 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 is called a deckled edge. And so that's kind of that ripped front edge. The face of the book is ripped, it feels ripped. That's a deckled edge. Yes, we can do it. Um, typically, those sorts of treatments, you're looking at like a thousand unit minimum to do it, just because there's not a lot of printers that do it anymore. So great, great question. So where do I start? POD, short run, long run, or distribution? Well, you start where you need to start. Typically, every author is starting with short run, we talked about that, Amazon, Ingram Spark, 10 copies, 15 copies, 20 copies, whatever it is, and then you graduate to uh, working with a custom printer more like what we do, so you can get a little bit longer, print runs done, and you can get your prices down, your quality there is there, and the big thing is that we actually answer the phone and talk to you, so uh, that's a big deal in this industry. There's a lot of people that don't do that, not naming any names. So uh, customer service is really important. So you do have the POD and ebook, Amazon only. Um, I can't believe my pictures are all gone. That's crazy. Personal selling. So this is a, this is what we were talking about with Ben. So you can do personal selling uh, with events, and it's important to understand printing strategy for that um, website. Um, we, if you don't have a website and you're not, and you probably have heard this a week if you're not selling online to your customers and getting their information and building a list you're missing out you've got to figure out how you touch your customer and know who they are and then be able to market to them on an ongoing basis and that's where the personal selling and inventory really comes in all right, special editions. I'm about seven minutes uh, left here, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to race through this. We've been answering questions, I think, as we've been going along. But some of the things that I get asked about a lot are, are, are special editions. So I'm going to just tell you a quick story. Persephone, Kevin J. Anderson, produced this two years ago. It was given to the directors and so forth of the movie that there's being made right now. It's really cool, loved it. Now he's doing a Kickstarter for that same book, and he wants the book to look like this. So we will be producing a book that's kind of got a leather-like material. It's got the foil stamp. It's got a four-color inlay on the cover. It's got four-color end sheets. Uh, it's going to have a tipped-in, signed, and, and numbered page uh, that's tipped in as well. So he's doing 500 copies. It's signed limited number edition. And we can do that at 500 units. We could do it for less than 500 units too, but you, you, every time, you know, it's just the cost goes up and up and up and up. So these are the types of things that are not outside the possibility for projects that you might want to be working on. Uh, we've done special editions like this one. I already showed you that. We do children's projects. We do board books. All of these things are available. Um, I'm sorry? <laughs> sprayed edges, yes, I can do spray ed sprayed edges. I think that was the number one question I got asked on Monday with the vendor table. But, but, but when I share, share the price with you, um, you're not going to do sprayed edges. So, <laughs> yeah, so uh, gold, it's, you call it uh, gold gilding on the edge. We can do that. There are very few printers that will actually do that anymore. It looks really cool. It is really expensive. So... Um, yeah, special editions, you're doing a Kickstarter like Kevin's doing here, you know, he's going to charge for his, his limited edition, he's charging 75 bucks, you know, and you can do that with fans. Some fans will pay for that. Uh, and so then you can start to add some of those bells and whistles like the 
edge painting, <laughs> which is, seems to be the, the big deal right now. Uh, we can do it, it's, it's just not very cheap. Box sets, this is also something we get asked a lot about. Um, it, 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 again, we got challenges on a couple of different areas. I'll talk about box sets and I'll talk about children's books here uh, real quickly. Yes, we can do box sets. We can do the sleeves, we can do actual printing, we can do the kitting, we can do the shrink wrap around them. It's all available. Uh, the, box, uh, the box itself, the sleeve, if I do 100 units, I have, one, I have one supplier that will do 100 units for me. Unfortunately, the price per box is about 20 bucks per box. So you got two grand, right? Two grand, 100 units. I got another vendor that will do the same thing, but their minimum is 1,000 a thousand units. But they'll do it for three bucks a box. So you got 2,000 or 3,000, you got 100 units versus 1,000 units. It, it's just not very user friendly. I understand that, but if you're interested in doing that, it is available. We can we can we can help you out with that, um, and it is available for independent authors. So we've got the kind of the the sleeve, the, the thinner sleeve. We can do archival boxes. Uh, the prices I quoted you are for the sleeve like this, but again, it's available. And 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 at Christmas season, you go into the Barnes and Nobles of the world and so forth. And you look at, and they have boxes all over the place because they're huge gift items. So if you can figure out the logistics and finances, we can we can make that happen. Um, children's books, real quick. I was in the children's books uh, uh, presentation earlier today, and we were talking about that. Uh, these can be printed at 50, 50 units each. I mean, we can, you, we can do this sort of thing. Challenge is price point, cost. You're looking at 50 units. You're looking at probably fourteen dollars a unit. And your retail price is probably going to have to be 15 to compete with everybody else. So it's hard. Uh, we do a lot of printing overseas. I print in China, and I get uh, the, the books like this, the 32 pages, for about two and a, between two and a half and three dollars a book. But you have to do a thousand. So again, options are there. Just just know that they're there, and, and then we can we can uh, help you figure that out. We talked about Kickstarters. Um, yeah, last slide here. Th this is what we do. I, I, I own a company that does all of this sort of stuff. Uh, primarily when I'm working with somebody on ghostwriting all the way down, uh, it is on a nonfiction project, not a fiction project, just because fiction authors love to write, love to network, love to have their own crew help them. If you don't have your own crew, I'm happy to talk about that with you, um, and we can help from the start on down through the finish. Um, we do all of these types of things. Primarily where I help the 50 books group is in printing because there are very few people that actually specialize in that area, in this area. So um, one last uh, story that I'll tell you because uh, I have like one, f one uh, just over a minute is to believe in yourself. Uh, if you don't believe in your book, your story, your message, no one else will either, okay? Um, there's plenty of stories out there of authors who have been denied, 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 rejected, and so forth. You've got the J.K. Rowlings of the world. You've got, uh, I, I happen to work for a large um, traditional publisher in Chicago, and we did uh, the Left Behind series, which was, uh, which was, uh, well, he was in the movie, yeah. It, the movies were terrible. Um, but the books themselves sold over 80 million copies. But the first book was rejected by over over 50 publishers, and they just pursued it, you know, and all these types of things because they believed in what they wanted to do. It was published, and it became an international phenomenon. So believe in yourself; you can do it, and we'd be happy to help. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to do that. If you want to drop a card or give me an email, I'll I'll email them to you. So we are like 30 seconds. Yes, go ahead. All right, uh, say we're doing a Kickstarter and we don't live in the United States. In fact, we don't even live in an English speaking country. Okay. And we're, you're printing books for us and maybe there's some signed books. Do you have any sort of services where one might be able to arrive where you're printing the books, sign them, and then ship them out? Would that even be economically viable? What do people usually do when it comes to fulfilling Kickstarter? 
Fulfilling Kickstarter and signatures, a lot of times people will do signature plates, which are stickers, for example. So you sign those, you ship this little box of signature plates to the printer, they stick them in the book for you, and it's all done. Oh, and readers don't mind that it's... They, they have your signature. They don't, they don't care. Interesting. That yeah, you don't want to be really shipping books all over the place multiple times. That That's crazy. That blows my mind. Thank you. Yes. All right, thank you.